Now, let's take just a moment and look at some of the most basic characteristics of debt versus equity financing because this is so important to any business, either starting a business or allowing that business to grow by creating more resources and opportunities for growth. First, let's look at the characteristics of debt financing. When financing with debt, borrowed resources or capital must be repaid at specified future dates, usually with interest. This is referred to, again, as debt financing, and it is debt is temporary financing because, in fact, whatever you receive in terms of resources of capital must at some future point in time actually be repaid. Now, this can be a problem because if businesses are not doing well and, you know, we're not making as much money as we thought we were doing, maybe the product isn't selling as well as we'd anticipated, if, in fact, we're not able to meet our projections and expectations in terms of success, then we may not actually be able to make the payments that are required under some form of debt, whether it be interest payments or to repay the original amounts that were borrowed. Unfortunately, the consequences of a failure to repay debts and the related interest on a timely basis can be very harsh. If you borrow money and fail to make payments, um, as described under the terms of that debt, you can be forced to basically sell your business, forced into bankruptcy or foreclosure, where, in fact, the assets or resources of the business have to be sold uh, in order to pay off those debts prior to what had originally been anticipated. Probably the most difficult aspect of debt is the difficulty in qualifying for it. Sometimes in describing, you know, the job description of a banker, for example, uh, who's a lender to businesses of capital or resources, I've heard this statement. A banker only lends you an umbrella when it's not raining. And to some extent, that makes sense, because in most cases, if you go to a bank and, or some other institution and want to borrow capital, it seems like the only time they're ever willing to basically lend it to you is when you don't need it. They're only willing to, to loan to people who have the capacity and, and performance and, and some kind of history, and, and, and it's almost like, you know, hey, we'll only loan it to you if you really don't need it. As a result, uh, certainly many startup businesses and other businesses may find that fin debt financing really isn't an option because they simply don't qualify for it. Now let's take another moment and look at some of the key characteristics of equity financing. Again, equity financing, investors contribute resources or capital in exchange for ownership interests in a business. Now, for a corporation, this ownership is evidenced by shares of stock. If you own a share of IBM stock, you are a part owner in that business. Ownership typically grants the following rights. A right to vote or have a say in the affairs of a business. Of the business. For example, if you own a share of IBM stock, you will get a ballot every year because you have the right to vote as an owner for certain um, issues that, uh, that affect that business. Now, if you're just starting your business, you're not some IBM large company, you know, that's been operating for, you know, 10, 20, 60 years or something like that, but if you're just a small business, this giving away of a right to vote or some say in the affairs of the business can be a very, very difficult decision. Heck, it's, it's your baby. It's your idea. When you bring in equity financing and therefore another owner in the business, they have the right to have some say relative to that business. And now it's just not your ideas that necessarily may be influencing the business, but other people may have some voice in the whole process. This can be kind of difficult. It's like, you know, being married, but without any physical attraction. I mean, really, in a marriage, you know, it's critical that you communicate and, and, and really discuss and work as a team relative to goals. And uh, thank goodness, that sometimes there's more going on here than just, you know, some common ideas or goals. You know, maybe there's a little physical attraction associated with the whole process. The problem with the business is, is when you bring in somebody as an investor, part owner of the business, uh, again, this process of being on the same page, having the same goals and ideas, um, again, there may be some difficulties there. But here, you don't have any advantages of you've got a physical attraction. So sometimes, uh, in the equity financing of a business, you need to consider the impact of the fact that you will now have some other people or institutions that may have an interest in and a voice in that business. Ownership in a corporation, for example, as we're discussing here, also gives uh, that owner a right or share to any of the profits of the business. You know, if you are a shareholder of IBM and IBM is profitable and as a result of that profitability they decide to distribute some of those profits to the owners, you have a right to share in those profits equally on a per share basis. If you only own one share, you get your one share's right to that sharing of profit. Now, this effectively represents a cost of capital that in many ways could be very, very expensive, maybe more expensive than the cost of interest associated with debt financing. For example, I read a story recently in a magazine about, uh, uh, with an interview of uh, Bill Marriott, who is the president of the Marriott Corporation, and this huge multi-billion dollar uh, company that, that owns hotels and operates hotels and has a variety of other different kinds of businesses. And he was telling the story about when his father, J.W. Marriott, was actually you know, starting that business. And when he was in the first stages of that business, uh, he was trying to decide how to finance uh, the purchase of the very first hotel. And again, he only had two options. He could borrow the money, or he could bring in owners or investors in order to accomplish it. And it was a very, very difficult decision because J.W. Merrick was kind of risk-averse. He, he didn't want to expose himself personally and, and, and all of his success up to that point in time in starting this business, you know, to the possibility that maybe that business might not be successful. And as a result, there might be consequences if, in fact, they're not able to make the payments on the debt as timely uh, as they needed to in order to, to really survive. And so at the time, uh, Mr. Merrick decided that, in fact, he would open up the ownership and share the ownership of his business and bring in investor capital so that he could properly capitalize his business and allow it to grow the way he wanted to. Bill Marriott says that today, the Marriott family owns only 18% of the stock of this business. Now, that's a lot, I mean, because 18% of billions of dollars is still, you know, a pretty hefty sum, and I'm sure, you know, the Marriott's aren't hurting. But he said that if his father, in that particular decision, had decided instead to access the capital resources and take the risk associated with debt financing, that the Marriott family today would own 85% of this multi-billion dollar different company. You can see that the decision there, in terms of how to finance the capitalization and growth of the business, was turned out to be very, very expensive in terms of the actual dollar cost by sharing that ownership. But Bill Marriott also made this point. He says, you know, you can always look at it that way and say, wow, that was an expensive way to finance the business. But at the same time, he says, I'm not sure the business would have grown as rapidly and, and really has been quite as successful if we didn't have really that, that equity financing in the beginning that allowed us to maybe expand a little more quickly than we could have under debt financing because the debt financing was a little more difficult to access. The last thing to note here is if you are a, an owner of a business, for example, a shareholder uh, in IBM, in the event that the business ever decides to terminate and basically go out of business, any shareholder, because they do effectively own the business, has a right to share in any remaining resources of the business in the event that the business terminates. Now, the good thing in equity financing is that investor contributions of resources to a business are not subject to repayment at a future date, and there are no interest charges. I mean, think about it. In this particular case, where you're bringing in owners' invested dollars, um, there is no obligation to pay those funds back. If, in fact, there was an obligation, what you're really doing is borrowing those resources. So equity financing is not really temporary and that you have to return those funds. Equity financing is permanent financing, which can really take a lot of pressure off of a business. The key advantage of debt financing, if we're going to focus on that, the key advantage, advantage of debt financing is that there is no sacrifice of ownership. Of ownership rights. For example, you're not giving away any of the say in the business. If you, if you finance with debt and don't bring any, any investors into the business in terms of their capital contributions, so that you're the sole owner of your little business that you're starting, you don't have to listen to anybody else. Nobody else has some kind of vested interest in what's going on. It's just you. You're the only one that owns it. And so, so you don't have to sacrifice ownership rights and therefore any voting uh, on the issues of the business. Plus, you're not going to have to uh, share any of the profits. If you borrow the capital that you require for your business through debt financing, then yes, you are going to have to pay interest,
I always have students who kind of stop me here and ask and say, hey, Norm, if in fact an owner or investor in a business puts resources into the business and the business is never really obligated to give those resources back, how does an owner, investor, get their investment back if in fact the business has no obligation to repay whatever contributed capital there was? Well, one of the ways that investors or owners make their capital investment back is if in fact there's a distribu distribution upon discontinuance of the business. You know, some businesses are actually organized and, and um, on the basis of, hey, this is going to be temporary. We're only going to be in business for a couple of years. The idea is to put in our money. We've got an idea that we think maybe uh, will work for a couple of years and maybe we can make some money and then when we're done with that, we'll basically discontinue the business or dissolve the business. In that particular case, if a business terminates, any excess resources of the business, after paying off all the debts, are then just distributed back to the owners. So we'll put our money in, hopefully make a lot of money, and then we'll terminate the business and take all the money that's left in the business there after paying off any debts and, and simply give it back to the owners. Now, there is no assurance that this distribution will be the same as the amount we actually originally invested. If it results in a higher or a lower amount, the investor effectively realizes a gain or a loss on investment, respectively. Now, the fact of the matter is, is you know, if you own a share of IBM stock and you're thinking that, gee, you know, when am I going to get my money back? And, and the only time I ever will is when IBM decides to discontinue the business, uh, you know, you might be waiting a long time because this is the kind of business that's been in business for, for years. And in fact, they have no plans to, to discontinue or dissolve the business and distribute back all the resources to all the owners that made the contributions originally. So the most common way owners or investors in these kinds of larger businesses that are really established operating on a long-term basis, the only way they get their invested capital back is through the subsequent sale of ownership interest to other investors. I mean, you can think of it this way. Let's say that you own a share of stock in IBM. If you went to IBM, call them up and say, hey, I own a share of stock and, you know, I want to get my, my capital back, you know, the amount that I paid for that stock. And IBM's going to tell you, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, contributions in exchange for that stock. Capital invests in the business. Uh, stays in the business on a permanent basis. We don't have any obligated, obligation to do that. You, you have to deal with that on your own. And, and frankly, they may suggest that if you actually want to get your money back, what you ought to do is call up your next door neighbor and see if they'd like to be an investor in IBM. Maybe they'd be willing to buy your stock. See, original investors of capital in, for example, let's look at corporations, receive shares of stock as evidence of their ownership interest and rights. This stock can be subsequently sold to other investors. Usually this is done through some kind of stock exchange, like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or the American Stock Exchange, Amex. If, in fact, you own a share of IBM stock and you sell it to another investor through the New York Stock Exchange, the amount that you receive upon the sale may be more or less than the amount that you originally invested in that stock in the first place, resulting in some kind of a capital gain or loss to you. Now, let me point something out here. All of the transactions that take place in the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or, or the American Stock Exchange are what we refer to as secondary stock transactions. This is a secondary exchange. These are transactions where stock is being bought and sold amongst investors. And the funds associated with any the sale of your share of IBM stock, none of that money is going to the business. So the question is, wait a second, how do businesses actually get capital from the issuance of stock? If, in fact, what you're saying, here, Norm, is stock is exchanged on the New York Stock Exchange and the money simply goes from one investor to another investor, and I'm suggesting to you that, that IBM doesn't share in any of those funds at all. The answer to this is that IBM, when IBM issues new stock, more stock, that on the original issuance, that the shareholders, new shareholders, additional shareholders will put in funds, put it into the business. So the company only receives capital contributions upon the original issuance of stock. And then the owners of that stock, in order to get out of that investment or to get their capital back, their only option is to sell it to other investors, and they're the sole beneficiaries of all those funds. So the fact of the matter is, is that IBM has not had an additional issuance of stock for quite a number of years. And so when transactions are taking place with IBM stock today, IBM receives none of it. The only time they ever received capitalization was upon the original issuance of the stock. Now let's kind of summarize uh, uh, this discussion by noting that there are really two ways owners or investors make a profit or loss on an investment in the ownership of a business, usually represented in corporate form, through the ownership of stock. One of the ways that they make a profit or loss on investment is by sharing in the business's operating profits. In this case, it would be a profit, not loss. If a business is profitable and generates additional resources through their profitable operations and decides to distribute some of those resources created through profitable operations back to the owners, this is referred to as a dividend. A dividend is one way an owner in stock gets a return on their investment or a profit. The second way owners or stockholders generate some kind of return or profit on their investment is through capital gains or losses upon the sale of the stock to other investors or through the distribution of assets upon the dissolution of the business. Now, again, we are discussing how businesses are financed. And consider, again, the possibility that you started your own business. And, and in the financing of that business, uh, you know, if you need $100,000 of capital to get going, uh, it would be terrific if you had some Uncle Joe who was very rich and loved you very much. And you go to Uncle Joe and you say, hey, I've got a great business idea and I, you know, I haven't been able to get any capital or resources. And gee, Uncle Joe, wouldn't you be interested in taking some of your petty cash? You know, you got 100000 laying around and uh, putting it in my business. And, you know, uh, I'd love to you know, borrow it from you or allow you to you know, have some kind of ownership interest in the business. And now this would be easy. This would be great, wouldn't it? But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, most of the times there, well, there's just no Uncle Joe around. In those particular cases, you actually have to try and, and find investors or creditors uh, from the general population. In those particular cases, most investors and creditors are not going to loan you just because they, they think you're a nice person or, or uh, you know, there's any kind of a relationship going on here. What they really want is to make an informed and intelligent investment decision. See, most investors and creditors require information for their investment decisions. Creditors want to evaluate a company's creditworthiness. They ask themselves this kind of question. Will this business actually be able to repay the debt plus interest on a timely basis in the future? And they'd like some information from you relative to your business, uh, if in fact it has been operating or what your ideas were and what your projections are. And, you know, they need some information in order to evaluate whether or not your company will be able to make the payments on the debt. If you're looking for equity financing from investors, these investors are going to want information to evaluate the profit potential of an investment in your company's business and their ownership. If it's, a, if in fact, you're a corporation, buy an investment in stock. And what the possibilities are that that stock will actually increase in value or there'll be substantial dividends available for distribution. That's some kind of return on their investment. The primary purpose of what we're going to refer to as financial accounting is to provide the information that assists investors and creditors in such evaluations to assist them in making these kinds of decisions as to whether or not they would be interested in actually providing capital through a loan or through an investment in a business. It's important to understand financial accounting, not only because you may need to start your own business in order to give information, quality information to potential investors and creditors, but in the future, you may be an investor yourself and need this kind of information. Again, this information is referred to as financial or is provided through financial accounting. I'd like to distinguish between financial versus managerial accounting, which are the two major categories of accounting information. As we just mentioned, financial accounting seeks to provide information to current or future providers of capital, primarily investors or creditors. In addition, this information is also used for other potential parties outside of management. For example, government regulatory bodies are also interested in the same kind of information that's typically made available to investors and creditors. They want to get a big picture of what the business is doing for regulatory purposes. What we're talking about is information to investors, creditors, government, uh, people or institutions that are outside of the daily management of the
would say that these users of information are really external to the operations of business. Now, the information that these external users, investors, creditors, government regulatory bodies need, uh, the providing of the information is accomplished primarily through what we call periodic general purpose financial statements. These financial statements are designed to provide basically summarized information that's usually historical, that's, uh, that is information relative to what's happened you know, just in the recent past or recent year, and what the status of that business is in terms of their financial position you know, currently. Uh, generally speaking, financial accounting really doesn't deal with, with uh, projections uh, relative to the future, and the reason for that we'll discuss in a little bit. We are going to be focusing in this class, at least for the first two thirds of this class, on financial accounting, on these general purpose financial statements that are required to be provided to investors and creditors or the government. It provides the, them with kind of an overall view of where the business is and, and where it's come from. Now, this two-thirds of the class is a little more than half the class, clearly, two-thirds is more than one-half. Um, even though we're going to be focusing on managerial accounting in that part of the process, so we're also going to be discussing a lot of terminology that's appropriate in terms of general business that will also have application in the area that we're going to discuss as managerial, or described as managerial accounting. Managerial accounting is what we're going to be uh, discussing really over the last third of this class. And managerial accounting seeks to provide information, not to external users, but to those who are internal to the business, to assist managers in the effective operation of business. Now, this is typically accomplished not through some periodic summarized reports. This is accomplished primarily through very, very timely, sometimes day-to-day -day customized management reports that tend to be a lot more detailed in nature, and in many cases may include a lot of budgetary forecasted information as well as historical data. These managerial reports, this information that management uses on a day-to-day -day basis to better operate uh, the business, are not generally available to the public or external users, and really are primarily designed to, to, to improve management's future performance. Again, we'll be discussing managerial accounting and how we can create information that's useful to managers in the last third of this class. But for now, we're going to kind of push managerial accounting to the side and really focus on the accounting designed to provide information primarily to providers of capital, investors and creditors, which is also used uh, by government regulatory bodies also.